I'm so excited. Let's get it started. So welcome our panelists. We're so glad to have you here. Uh, first of all, we have our Holly here. So the founder and CEO of Hunstock at Co. Uh, we'll probably get you to introduce yourself later. And uh, Paul Plabu, um, um, the founder of Zenva, um, um, really, really high portfolio speakers. And also Josh Case, uh, we met uh, actually in Israel for a start of venture with UQ Ventures a year, two years ago. Um, yeah, we really want to know uh, about your journey. How did you start your side hustle and why did you start? So over to you guys. Maybe Josh first. Thanks, Ocean. Uh, thank you for the warm introduction. Um, yeah, so my, my name's Josh. I'm a junior doctor currently working in emergency medicine at Toowoomba Hospital. Um, and I'm also a freelance software developer. Um, and I've kind of always had a very strong entrepreneurial drive right through my university years, my high school years. Um, and I think I, I wasn't really getting the kind of um, business satisfaction from being in a clinical environment. And that sort of, I think that was part of what led me to really start side hustling a little bit. Um, what I'm doing at the moment is, uh, as of January, spending half of my time trying to build uh, technologies to make hospitals safer and more efficient, um, or in short, automating really boring hospital processes. Um, so maybe I'll leave that like that for now and um, we can pick it up later on. Um, hi everyone, my name is Pablo. I'm the founder of Zemba, an online academy that helps people succeed in their coding careers and uh, hobbies. Um, over the years, we've taught coding and game development to a little bit over a million learners and um, we have um, around 150 courses covering different areas of um, programming, game design, and immersive technologies. Um, this started, this did not start as a pitched idea or as a business plan or any of those things. It definitely started as a side hustle. So I was a, a freelance developer as well at, uh, back a few years ago. And I started making courses sort of to, to get a bit of extra income, see what happened. And one thing led to the next, and eventually I, I, I became my main full-time activity. So I'll talk about, uh, more about that later. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Holly Hunt, um, founder of Women in Digital and Hunting Co. Um, so I guess where it all began for me, um, I had just started in an um, ASX-listed recruitment agency. I was recruiting in digital. It was this new thing that was going to change the world, and it sure has. Um, so at the time, um, I guess what I was observing, I was going out to different industry meetups. I was um, noticing that there weren't as many female-oriented events, um, I guess, environments that, you know, I would typically want to go into and learn about the industry. Um, I also found that some of the females that I was meeting, the candidates, um, they de definitely didn't have the confidence that their male counterparts did. And at the same time, I was really frustrated in my career. I had... Um, I guess it wasn't quite where I saw myself having studied a HR and international business degree. Um, and I was really fortunate to have had a mentor kind of take me under her wing. Um, so I just put all these pieces together and went, I feel like, you know, having been lucky enough to be mentored by another woman, um, that maybe some of these younger female candidates could really benefit from a network and a mentoring opportunity. Um, so it was in response to a need and um, in response to my own drive to have a little bit more purpose and fulfillment in my career. Um, so I decided to start Women in Digital as a way to connect my clients and my candidates on mentoring um, opportunities. Um, and from there, I just dabbled and tried different things with what, what the community wanted. So that's kind of how it, how it all began. Yeah, I mean, that's awesome. I mean, each of you is so different, coming from really different backgrounds. Um, but I do see the common ground between three of you. You, you, you all three see um, the demand in the market and you spark an idea. So my next questions, um, I guess a lot of audience would be really interested in is how did you validate your ideas? How do you know your idea is worth solving? Um, so Holly, probably you start first. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, like, first of all, it was just being really in touch with the people that I was trying to solve a problem for and actually asking the question, like, you know, if I was to host an event, would you be interested? If I was to organise a mentoring course um, or program, would you be involved? 
would you actually pay for that? Would you pay to attend this event? And then just, it's scary, but actually just doing it and putting it out there and seeing if anyone's willing to pay to attend an event that I was going to host um, or um, whether or not they were going to pay to be involved in a mentoring program. So I think, yeah, the number one point of validation is if you're able to actually take some money off somebody for something, you've got a business idea that's going to work. Um, in, in my case, it was um, basically me being the target market and developing something that was like for past Pablo. So uh, I've always been interested in education, comes from, from my family, both my parents uh, working in, in, in different areas in education. And uh, shortly after I graduated, a um, long time ago, as you can see there, I was working as a, as a web developer. And on the side, I was trying to learn how to make games that run on the browser, something that's very, <laughs> sure, interested a lot of people. Back, back then, it was kind of new. Um, and, um, and I couldn't find good resources, so it took me a while to get the basics. And then all of a sudden, I came to uh, a website that was relevant at the time where people could upload and sell courses. And I was like, hmm, what happens if I make a course on this thing that took me so long to learn? So I did that. I recorded some, some screencasts. And I put it up there, and it was like what I would have liked to have found a year ago. And people started buying it, so that got the validation of, of having those customers. Um, so that, is, that, would, that would be the very initial stage. And then on a later stage, the big validation that we had was just going on Kickstarter, which is a crowdfunding platform. So we put this big project out there. We want to make the biggest game development course ever created as an online, in the online medium. This was going to be 50, developing 15 mini games. And we put that on, on Kickstarter, it raised enough money for us to build it. So we went uh, back to Kickstarter, and we repeated that cycle 14 times, <laughs> raising around 400,000 in, in a span of four years. Uh, we did the last one in 2019. Uh, so that was, that's how we basically validated our products, our ideas, and fueled our growth at the same time without having to raise money from investors. Um, so I would go with you definitely if you have to find people that want to buy your product. And, you yourself as a customer is always a, also a good measure. Like if you're, if you're not going to use it, that's just more difficult. So you have to then think of someone else or maybe you it could be an imaginary persona that might not exist. That's a great story of grit. <laughs> thanks, thanks for sharing that, Pablo. Um, absolutely echo what Holly says. Um, you need to put something up for sale. That's my personal opinion. You know, all the things like, um, you know, questionnaires and um, asking your family and friends and all that sort of stuff, they're all kind of, secondary and tertiary to um, will people cough up some money for what I'm offering. Um, another thought that I'd add here would be, um, you know, validating a business idea is um, the reason that you do that is to protect yourself from risk. Okay. So if you're, if you're, you know, if you've just raised a zillion dollars to go and pursue some idea or, or if someone is going to give you a million dollars to pursue something, they will want evidence that you have a market there to back you up. Okay. Because the risk is high. So they want a large amount of of evidence to support it. If we're thinking more in, you know, if we're talking about side hustles, we're not necessarily talking about people who are trying to raise a million dollars in seed money to go and do things. So when the risk is small, for example, um, uh, maybe you've got an idea for a side hustle and that's a, a, a book about gardening for great plants in, in Queensland. The risk of putting that together is probably, you know, a few dozen hours perhaps to get the first version out. So in my mind, it's actually really important to consider the amount of risk that you're taking on when you're thinking about validating an idea. If it's not very risky, you should just do it. You shouldn't spend time with questionnaires, asking your family and friends and all that sort of stuff. Put something up for sale and see what happens. Yeah, that's really a great response. And I echo you, Josh, um, um, just from the perspective of starting at Saha, so. And show hands, how many of you actually want to start something today and has an idea in mind? Got one here, awesome, you can pitch later on. <laughs> um, yeah, a few more as well. And I guess a lot of people think um, starting a side hustle, um, they may not think of making money at the beginning um, or their intention or their purpose is not about making money or commercialize the, the products or the service they are trying to make. But um, the reality is, if you want to sustain your um, side hustle, your project as a business or as an organization in general, you need to find some kind of 
revenue revenue stream, uh, no matter it's from uh, your customers directly or from any sponsorship from the government or any business model, you still need to think about that if you want to make it scalable and sustainable. And um, and I guess three of you have really um, a great story about um, putting your yourself out there and uh, making your project as a business. Um, a question in particular to George, and by the way, for everyone who are online today, if you have any questions to our panelists, please uh, ask them in the Q&A session. Uh, just navigate to your um, Q&A button on the bottom. Uh, ask questions. If you're looking for questions to a particular speaker, just put the speaker name at the end of the questions, and we will go through that at the Q&A later. And for those who are in person today, uh, we will pass uh, the mic later, uh, get you to ask questions, and we, we have uh, wipe and sensitizer here, so we will make sure we are um, the hygiene up to standard. And we have a doctor here, so <laughs> you can save life. <laughs> cool. Josh, um, so I know you're working part-time as a junior um, doctor and also a freelance um, software developers. How do you balance your time, work-life balance, etc.? Yeah, that's a great question. It's it's not easy. <laughs> um, and I do have the pendulum sort of swings from left to right in terms of, um, you know, how much I'm able to put into my clinical work versus, you know, side hustling with software and that sort of thing. Um, and the other part of that, you know, working for yourself also, it's very hard to, you know, for at least my clinical work, I have a start date and a start time and an end time that's very easy to follow. But when you're working for yourself, that temptation to stay in bed for another hour is kind of always there. So that's not easy. Um, I have a few things that I've put in place. Um, I plan a long time in advance. So I have a calendar where I put my clinical work in and then I actually put work days in my calendar, even though it's just for myself, even though I'm at home trying to work on whatever I'm working on at the time. I've, I've, deliberately um, put time in my calendar. And that's a very, um, it's an important thing. It's a conscious choice to, to work on these things at that time. At least it is for me. I think in the early days, it was a lot easier to um, let these things develop spontaneously. You know, if I had a few spare hours out on a Saturday afternoon and when inspiration strikes, I'd drive for it. I would just go for it. Um, but now that I'm trying to pursue it in a more of a kind of official or professional capacity, I really make a conscious choice to plan to do it. Um, I've also really had to master routine. So I wasn't, a, um, I was never really an organized or routine person growing up, but I, as much as possible, try to set, um, get the same sleep hours every day. Where, um, so I get up early. <laughs> That's another big tip if you're trying to get side hustling, uh, something, a side hustle going, especially while you're working. At least for me, I found it, um, my first two hours of, of the day were a lot better than my last two. Um, so if one day a week you can get up a bit earlier, do those first two hours on whatever, um, you're working on and that's also you know if you've got um, a high level of motivation to get your project done that's a really cool way to help get you out of bed in the morning um, outside of that you know I try to um, uh, I started meditating at the start of the year which sounds like a really kind of hippie sort of thing to say and I, I'm almost like a little bit cringing if coming to a panel and someone saying you should all meditate but I meditate for 10 minutes a day and I can't speak highly enough of the um, increased productivity higher amount of focus reduce levels of stress. Like I find working for myself extremely stressful because I don't have people to um, distribute the stress across or share with. Um, I don't know if you guys are the same, but- um, Was yeah, that a medical yeah. advice or a general advice? Yeah, uh, consult your own doctor for medical <laughs> advice, yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, how about Holly and Pablo? How, how about back in the days when you first started? I mean, you guys were not, went straight into the business. You guys were, you know, starting with your part-time. How do you balance out your life, especially, you know, um, when it comes to work and uh, projects, different things, family? Yeah. Um, two different things to, that I want to say to that. Um, number one, every morning I'm a bit OCD about creating a list of things that I need to do for the day and prioritising them ABC. Um, and, you know, the A's are the non-negotiables, the B's are nice to have and the C's can move over to another day. Um, so I think that really helps because there is a lot of mental fog when you're trying to, um, I guess, distill all the things that you need to do. Um, the second thing is I was so obsessed, so obsessed with what I was doing that like I would just work and work and work. Um, and I've definitely got a lot more balance now. Um, but I think to begin with, I really loved what I was doing. So I would just pour 
a lot of time into it and I just realized that if I like if this was a priority to me then there were sacrifices to make so you know I just had to be very conscious about what those sacrifices were like so you know prioritizing certain friends and going well you know what you can't go to every party you can't go to every this or that um just being very conscious about how I'd use my time but yes lists very good very important um when I when I first started, I was doing um, I was doing contract work, and I also had a, a startup that never took off, uh, which unfortunately took me too, way too long to put an end to it. It was a school management system, terrible. Uh, and uh, why is that? But I I I I've never yeah, I just don't ha I I found pretty early in life that I just don't have the capacity to overwork myself, so I just can't work too much. <laughs> like I I can't have those crazy weeks. If I do, then I. I pay with counter productivity the day after, sort of like getting a loan, you have to pay it back. So um, I used to work a lot more than I do, but it would have never been like anything like crazy weeks. And, it, and that was also because, um, I, because I couldn't, it's not that I didn't want to, I just, I, I just, I would get distracted. I also want to do other things in life. I, I think it's, it's important to try to get, get, a, get, a, get good rest, to, to, to exercise and to, to also have a you know, social life and everything else, family. And whatnot, and, and especially now um, that I've got a, a young son, and I make that a, a priority. So I don't really work that that many hours. Um, I think that if you build that in that manner from the beginning, you kind of just never do the things that take time. You kind of like you're just like forced to do only the most essential things, and say no to a lot of things and leave a lot of things on the side. Um, but I, I definitely acknowledge that that is hard to do if you have, let's say, a full-time job because then you or, or a, a part-time job or a job, job when you have a fixed amount of hours because then you just have to make it fit. So yeah, it comes down to 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 sacrifice a little bit, to discipline, to planning, and you have to find what works best for you. If you if lists work for you, you know, to list if if you just need. Um, sometimes I find that that like, strict planning works really well for me. Some other times it's just like I. I just kind of let it see where it where it end up. Um, so definitely, it's, see how you work best. If you work best in the morning, if you work best at night, if you're a night owl, all of those things you need to know and use for your advantage. Yeah, um, totally agree. And I mean, and one thing I find from all of you is you know your priority, so you know what to do and when to do uh, each day, and and you make plans and stick with it. And that, I guess that's really important. A lot of people, they make a lot of plans, organize things really well, but end up not flowing, executing uh, what they promised to do. And for those who are here working full-time, uh, don't you know, leave your job tomorrow and kickstart your side hustle for now. Think about your life in general, what you want to achieve for the next uh, couple of years. And I guess that's that's you guys, um, uh, when, when you guys start off, uh, some of the questions you, you ask yourself as well. Um, another question about motivation. I mean, you probably uh, answered those questions, but like, how do you motivate yourself when there is no, no, when you don't have a boss to, you know, point to you what to do and what's time, how do you set, you know, things, uh, set goals for yourself and make sure you stick with those goals? Um, um, in, in, in my case, uh, I have very low motivation when I'm forced to do something. And if I, if I don't force to do something, I, I just have the motivation to do what I feel like needs to be done or that I want to do. So way before I started um, this this company, I had a lot of other side projects, not com not necessarily commercial. Like um, I used to teach people how to make beer, craft beer. Um, <laughs> I did a lot of like volunteering at uni. Um, I, at UQ, I was at the at the start of the entrepreneurship club, which didn't ex we we started with a housemate and a couple other students. Um, so I think it's it's. You're not like, and I can see it also with my young son that people are naturally motivated when they think they want to do. So like a lot of like, like lack of motivation sometimes it's just maybe your body rebelling against what you're forcing or your, what your, your body and your mind rebelling against what you're trying to make them do. And maybe you have to find something that motivates you a little bit more, whether it's computer, uh, working, um, I don't know, working with people or doing some other, some other area. Um, absolutely. Motivation wanes, um, you know, and there are different parts of your side hustle that you're going to want to work on more than others. Um, I think having an accountability whether person, whether that's a buddy, a coach, um, somebody who you can share what you're working on and know that you're going to um, at each catch up have to tell them 
how far you've come on that. Um, I found that to be the most effective. Um, it's very easy to get in the kind of weeds being busy as opposed to working on the things that really matter. So I think if you have the chance to kind of step back and talk to somebody, either, you know, they may have successfully run a side hustle or maybe they're just a buddy who, um, you know, is really keen to see you succeed. Um, but the opportunity to kind of just like download and go, this is what I'm trying to achieve what are the and and reflect? Um, you can kind of create those little milestones and then set those regular intervals of how often you're going to catch up, um, and that just forces me into action anyway. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. A um, couple of like little things that I'll add there. Um, absolutely agree with that point about um, it being easy to work on things that don't matter. Like it's so at least my personal experience, especially working for myself, where I'm both setting the agenda and working on the agenda. Um, it's just so, so easy to fill an entire week with things that are tangential to what the goal is, not really getting you in the right direction. And you do feel, you get tired, you know, work is otherwise as it would be, you get tired, you feel like you're doing a good job and you're not working on the right things. So recognise that your motivation or energy level, especially if you're working full time, if you're studying full time, recognise that that's the most precious resource, your energy level and your motivation is the most precious resource that you have and make a deliberate choice to put it into the things that matter the most. Um, and secondly, um, when I first started getting sales, what I did is make sure that I get both an email notification and a pop-up on my phone when, um, whenever I, I make a sale because that um, it's kind of got this weird property where, um, you know, I can be down in the dumps and want to quit for a day and then something pops up and you say, oh, great. You know, people are, you know, um, I, I don't know what it's like for you guys, maybe more so in the early days, but working for myself in entrepreneurship is this roller coaster. It's kind of like this. It's this psychological struggle as much as a, as a cognitive one. And so getting those little small wins and celebrating those small wins really um, help get me going and, and sustain me. <clears throat> yeah, love it. I mean, um, having someone to work along with you, not necessarily uh, to have a partner or like business partner or per se, but just having your clients or you know other members on journey with you, that's really important. And also Josh mentioned, um, yes, yeah, celebrate small wins. When you make a sales, when you get validation, celebrate talk to other people, uh, celebrate with, with other people. Um, and I mean, like not everyone here, um, when they start side hustle, they're looking to turn it into a business. Um, they may, you know, just want to do like um, freelance photography or to do uh, freelance production, whatever. Um, but you guys are in a really good examples of turning your side hustle as your main hustle. I guess that's especially for Holly and, and uh, Prabhu on, on your journey and Josh a bit early on that journey. Um, can you guys go through um, when did you make the decision to turn your side hustle as your main hustle to make sure, okay, I now going to work on it 100%. Uh, was it a decision based on how much you're making or was it a decision from, you know, someone else telling you or et cetera? Um, I was a really bad employee. So I think there was this motivator of what other choice do I have? Um, but also, uh, I guess I got to the point where I, the passion that I had for what I wanted to do on the side completely distracted me on a day-to-day -day basis from working for anybody else. Um, so it just got to this point where it wasn't if I would make it my full-time gig, it was when and how. Um, I... I guess, you know, I'm fortunate that my parents, they're small business owners as well. So that was never a crazy concept for me. Um, if my parents were quite risk averse and did, were working for somebody else, I think uh, my advice to my younger self would have been like surround yourself with other people who have done that because to somebody who doesn't want to take the risk, it seems crazy. Um, and, you know, that psychological barrier is probably the hardest part to um, taking the leap and making your side hustle your full-time hustle. Um, yeah, absolutely. I guess I just got to the point where I realised that what I was able to charge people and what I was able to financially recoup would make a sustainable living if I was doing the right activities. Um, and so, you know, one day I just, um, I guess I'd left my last role um, started the business and it was an anxious six weeks of, oh my God, I don't, am I actually, a, do I own a business? I'm not sure. Um, and then, you know, you get your first big invoice paid and you're like, I'm a business owner. Um, so that was the big moment where I was like, right, this, this can actually happen. And I'm in, in control of that. 
for me, it was sort of a, a slow process. Um, but yeah, it was maybe two years after I started making courses that uh, on one hand, uh, the, the other startup idea was just not going to take off, and I wanted to, to, to stop working on that. At the same time, working on clients for projects, uh, like the contract work wasn't as, as rewarding. It was actually stressful because there were deadlines, and you were kind of creating like other people's business, or other, like I wanted to have my own stuff. Um, and at the same time, the, 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 like there was a lot of interest in the courses that, that I was making. I had already started hiring authors to, to have more stuff in our catalog. And back then, I was just selling things on like a third-party platform. I didn't, we didn't have our own website, but I was starting to work in, in setting that up as well. And so it kind, of, it kind of happened like kind of organically. It wasn't like once a day that I said, okay, that's it for the other ones. In fact, there's still a school that uses my system. I don't charge them anymore. I just keep it running on like the cheapest sort of plan. I don't want to hear about them though. <laughs> and uh, and then uh, and, and also like one of the contracts that I had still also carried on for a little a little bit longer, but it was like yeah, this is what I'm what I want to be doing the, the business that I want to be working on. Um, and I I think it's important to mention as well that not all side hustles have to become your main occupation. That not all side hustles have to be uh, become like a uh, like a company with employees or anything like that. Uh, if you know if somebody's happy. It, like you, you can a side hustle can be selling, like making some stuff and selling them the weekends at the markets, or having like a food truck of something with something unique that you really enjoy making. It gives you a bit of cash. So it's also, I think, it's important to us, like from my experience at least, to be mindful you, with yourself in the expectations that you set. Um, because if you set like really high expectations, you uh, it might not be uh, with reality, and you might not enjoy it as much. If you already have like a main a main full time activity, you want your side hustle to be more on the on the enjoyable side, and obviously, if it's joined, if it's getting traction, you can make it grow. If it doesn't work, yeah, but you enjoy, it, you can keep it. And if it, if it, if if it's time to kill it, kill it early and try something else. Yeah, a couple of things to add. I'm obviously a fair bit earlier in the journey than both Pablo and Holly. Um, I had a few moments. Um, one of my early successes with the automation tools that I was building was when. I automated this terrible, terrible morning task for all the junior doctors all across Queensland where um, basically, I, I won't bore you with the details, but basically there are sort of seven different information systems in um, public hospitals. And I built a tool that sort of tied the, and one of the, one of the jobs for the doctors in the morning, the junior doctors in the morning was to come in and get the appropriate pieces of information from all the systems and sort of tie it together into a nice Word doc and print it out and give it to everyone in the team that they, we're working with. Um, and I had prototyped a tool just for myself that would, sort of do this task for us. It used to take about an hour in the morning. You'd be coming at five o'clock to do it. We'd do a, spend a full hour doing this. And this tool made it take about 10 minutes. Um, and I was walking along with, um, you know, it was a shocking day. It was like a 16 hour day. And my cons my boss, who was a consultant surgeon was, um, so he's, you know, been out of med school for like 20 years. And he was like, Josh, you know, back when I was an intern, um, when we'd all come in the morning, uh, come into work in the morning, we'd have to go to all the computer systems and put it all into a Word doc and print it out. And I was like, "Yep, what do you think we do every single morning?" So things hadn't changed in 20 years. Um, and basically, project up and I shared it. Um, that got shared all around Queensland. Had like a thousand shares on LinkedIn. It was like the second thing that I'd ever posted on LinkedIn, and it just went everywhere. Um, and that's probably one tip that I'll give you out of that. If you are working on something, a side hustle, you have an idea for a side hustle, you should document the process um, that you're going through, even if it's at an early stage where you um, you think you've only identified an opportunity and you haven't acted on it. Write something, share it, and say, "Look, this is what I'm looking at. These are the steps that I'm taking to." Um, explore whether this is an opportunity because that um, process of storytelling, one, makes it public very early on, which sort of puts yourself out into the world, which is the step that most people don't take. And two, um, it's an way to um, tell stories about the brand and the product that you're working on. That's the most authentic way that you can market something, in my opinion, is by actually documenting the process of going through, um, of launching your side hustle. <clears throat> yeah, cool. Do you all get your customers before making your SaaS or main hustles or, or which, what, what's the process? So do you get revenue before or after when you turn your SaaS as a business? So I guess that's more related to the validation my, question. My personal opinion is that the vast, for the vast, vast majority of companies, you should have some, in fact, probably a lot of revenue before you go part-time or full-time on it. Um, that doesn't apply to all companies. If you're going to raise a lot of money and go build robots, you probably, you know, you might have to go several years. 
you know, in this kind of Silicon Valley kind of mindset, but the vast, vast majority of companies don't fall in that basket. Yeah, cool. Um, I mean, so don't fall into your ideas, uh, don't fall into your, like, fall in love in your ideas and your solutions, always about the market and always make sure there are people who love your idea before and they will pay for it before you uh, commit to the idea and, you know, commit full time to the idea. Um, and, and I guess in start, we always talk about like ideas is nothing, it's, it's the execution. So once you have validation, once you have done your market research, um, you, you work on the idea um, and you may get a chance to win in the market, but not necessary. But, but don't be scared. It's, that's, the, that's the nature of startups and also entrepreneurship, I guess. Um, it's about risking. Um, um, and Josh mentioned um, taking manageable uh, risks um, uh, and also probably mentioned as well, like if you feel you're going to fail your idea in the early stage, fail fast, fail early rather than later. Um, General questions to all of you. So what are the barriers or obstacles when you first started and how do you ov overcome them? Probably the first uh, barrier you faced when you um, first started. Um, I faced a lot of barriers. So uh, b before I, I started Zemba, I had already, like I mentioned before, I had a startup that didn't take off. But before that, I also had some other ideas that never took off. Um, with, uh, the, with, with Zemba, I think that one of the barriers or one of the mistakes, I guess, was not to jump full time in it earlier than I did, because when uh, when we, we were already generating revenue that was enough to pay for my living expenses, I was in Chile, so a lot cheaper than here. <laughs> and, um, and instead, I just continue doing these other things for maybe an extra year that I should have. And what happens is that when I first started this thing, um, online training wasn't as competitive as it is today. I mean, with COVID, like universities have jumped on board and it's it's no longer a blue ocean. It's, it hasn't been a blue ocean for many years, but it, that makes it obviously harder to, to like start. So when I first started, it was when this was firstly becoming like a novelty and there were a lot of, there were companies like Udemy that were just like burning through cash to get students. And the ones that were actually making money were the instructors because they were paying these like huge ad campaigns. And so having more courses at that stage would have set us up for a bigger base to start with. But, um, uh, that's one 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 thing. And when it comes to motivation, I, I mentioned before that you know that, that's another obstacle. But it's not that I, I like I think I might have given the impression that I that I that I always have motivation. I have motivation for things that I want to do. But once you grow a little bit, some of the uh, the best opportunities or the low hanging fruit is going to be in the things that you find boring that you don't want to do. So um, keep that in mind as well that um, you do. Uh, there's a, there's doing only what you really want to do at the, at the moment gets you a certain far, but then there's a point where if there's some stuff that you find boring, for example, I don't know, finance for me or accounting and those things. And I learned all that stuff like the last year uh, and it, it had really, really good uh, positive impacts in the business and other things like that. Um, even trying to build partnerships and things like that are not something that I was keen on doing at first. I just wanted to create the content, have a good product. So that's uh, also something to, to keep in mind. Um, for me, I think the barriers were uh, financial. So having that sort of runway of cash or savings that you have decided is going to be enough to give it a go, say, for three months. Um, so that was one, saving up that money. And then two was um, just psychological. Like I think it's scary to go um, to, you know, starting a business, you know, from a side hustle to a full-time business. That is an overwhelming um, process and you think about failure. You know, what are other people going to think of me if this doesn't work out? Um, what's What What are my backup options? Um, so overcoming those um, kind of factors. I would say the most important thing is to surround yourself with people who have been through the same journey are supportive of that journey and um, they don't think you're crazy. Um, I kind of at the time likened it to um, jumping off a cliff with a parachute and not being sure whether or not it was going to open. It, that's, you know, a really overwhelming feeling and you need people who are crazy enough to run at that jump with you as well. Um, so, yeah. And I guess that's how you started your second project with women in technology, uh, in technology right? 
Yeah, women in digital came first um, and then it basically got to the point where um, I realised that, you know, Hunting Co as a recruitment agency was something that people would pay for. A complimentary business that I'd started people were paying for was women in digital. So women in digital side hustle got to the point where I realised, you know, as a recruiter that was um, something that I could do on my own and that people were buying from me first and foremost. Um, so none of this is really that entrepreneurial. I think, you know, the way in which I've gone about it is um, probably different to most um, having, you know, led with that community orientation and um, led with that diversity lens, you know, coming from a women in digital organization. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, if we bring it back to the question around those, those barriers, um, make sure that you find, find the right people to surround yourself with. Right. Um, in the meantime, I'm just going through uh, the Q&A on Zoom. Um, and there's a question to you, Holly, about um, how and what did you get your first wave of clients? And what will you do differently if you had a chance to start, start again? Um, how did I get my first clients? Um, I guess I had been working in recruitment previously with that um, that other organisation. So I had built a base of contacts in the industry that I then reached out to and said, hi, I've started my own agency. Um, the reality is, I guess, you know, I, I was it was a sales role. So um, my job was to go out and build new connections as well. Um, so that's how I got my first range of clients um, for what is, you know, the majority money-making um, part of the business. Um, as far as what I would go back and do again, I'm not a structured person and I've learned that structure is key to a successful business. Um, so I guess I wish that from the start I'd been a lot more structured um, around, you know, I guess process documentation, um, getting an accountant on board, at the start of the financial year as opposed to the end of the financial year. Um, all those little things um, that really do make a difference at tax time. Yeah, going to do an embracing plus here. So uh, with the UQ Young Alumni Advisory Board, we run a series of financial workshops as well. So make sure you stay in touch online uh, and follow our website. And back to you guys. Yeah, yeah. Just um, jumping in on that question about the barriers to getting started. I had many personal barriers. One was... Um, one in particular was learning to say no. So um, in terms of the career move that I made, I probably had it up my sleeve more than a year in advance. Um, and certainly through med school and even after med school, I was on every committee. I was the IT officer for this. I was convening that. Um, and basically once I said, I wanna take this a little bit more seriously, I became a lot more selective about the opportunities that I took outside of this. I'm not saying don't do those things, don't participate in your community, but just make very deliberate choices and don't be a yes person all the time. Once I started saying no, um, I saw my product should be increase a lot in the direction that I wanted it to go. Um, another thing that I'd say there is, I know we've kind of all been talking about, you know, software and like obviously work, you know, um, women in digital and all that sort of stuff. I wouldn't want anyone who's non-technical in the room to feel like they couldn't do something in, a, in the domain of a side hustle. There's lots and lots and lots of people doing $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 a month in all sorts of different things. If you can read and write, you can write some sort of it. Um, you can write something uh, that will educate someone on a topic. You probably know things like, how to fish or where to fish in Brisbane or how to make clothing or how to do cool tricks on your skateboard or um, how to make beautiful Vietnamese food. You know things and there are other people in the world who want to know the things that you know and the internet can help you find them. So if you can read, write, make a video, if you can really teach someone anything, you can find a way to put that into a bottle and put it on the internet and um, websites like Gumroad can help you find them. <clears throat> Awesome. That's echo um, the questions on foundation really well. And yeah, I was a bit concerned actually in the beginning when we put a panel together because all of us uh, were some kind of in a tech space. I mean, HR tech and math tech and also building games. Um, um, and I do acknowledge that people who want to, you know, make their side hustle as a Uber driver or something else. Um, but what we are talking about here is um, actually committing your time and your passion to make something impactful. Um, to yourself, to the industry, and also to the world, you know, saving the world with better medical technology, building more games with more efficiencies, or HR, building more diversity to the market in, in, in our ecosystem, um, tech or non-tech. Um, just keep the questions coming um, uh, on, for our online participants. Uh, we've got a questions here to all the participants on um, 
how do you identify problems or enter an area where you don't really have connections? Um, for example, HR, or the market is a bit restricted in the sense of assess people who are willing to share their problems with someone, for example, in the med tech, uh, in the med um, echo industry. Um, so it's a big question. Um, yeah, up to you guys. About the, just on that point about um, entering a domain that you don't know people or know the domain very well, I guess in that I'd say proceed with extreme caution. Um, it's very, very easy to assume you know what the big problems are um, and they're not actually very big problems. I see it all the time. It's kind of med tech, digital health type events where every single person is working on, you know, AI this and augmented reality that and the types of problems, you know, that's probably this much of what I see day to day is the problems that affect me as a doctor, like, di you know, diagnosis and all that sort of stuff with scans are an issue, but like this much, there's so much kind of like way um, lower hanging fruit um, uh, that the technology has existed for a long time to be able to solve. It's more a matter of kind of connecting the dots. It's not a matter of, you know, making um, giant leaps in technology to really get there. Um, so. Uh, proceed with caution is what I'd say. You need to get as close as you can to the problem. Really have your finger on the pulse, both so that you can, one, make sales, and two, um, understand um, the response that your product is getting and, and take that feedback to make your product better. Um, so I think that Josh, um, you covered a lot of the stuff that I was going to say, but the connections Good. part is the, <laughs> the connections part. Um, people are, are a lot more open to giving advice than they are to being sold something. So if you are looking to enter a different domain, uh, one way to, to, to establish connections there is to um, try to speak with as many people as you can from that domain. And when you approach them, don't try to sell them or to pitch them your solution. Just ask, be genuine and ask for the advice. You know, I, I, I'd say, for example, especially you know if they want some some of the people are watching our, our students when you're still a student you have that you, the, we, you still keep your email address but just having that kind of like I'm a student I would like to learn about blah blah, blah. just use that do that as much as you can because those doors uh, they're, they're not as open after you're a student but even after you're a student like it's been very very useful to me uh, the just reaching out to people and asking for advice and People like just love to love to share what they know, and uh, some people will have almost like an ego boost that you want to uh, learn from them. Um, but yeah, if you go and try to pitch them, that's a whole other conversation that people can just immediately shut. Um, yeah, I feel the same way. Probably proceed with caution, but if you're really gung ho about something, um, consider getting a co-founder who has that domain expertise. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, now it's 6.46. Uh, we may just pass around the mic to see if there are any questions from the room. And I will ask questions um, um, on behalf of the online participants as well. But anyone has any questions, please raise your hand. We've got sensitizer here, so we'll make sure it's, it's clean and, and safe. Thank you for that great talk. Um, I just have quite a general question. Um, this is about how do you monetize on an opportunity that doesn't exist, but you know that's going to exist in the future, such as for like automated cars, that's going to be like coming in. But how do you like develop some sort of like business strategy to kind of you know like make, you know, money off it? Uh, yeah, it, it, it's hard to, to respond to that for me because I haven't done that. I don't just like to say the things that have worked for me or haven't worked for me. But what would come to mind would be to see what intermediate steps you get there and see which one of those are achievable to you. Uh, so if you're talking about, you know, going to Mars, you probably need to do something with rockets or something with energy storage, I guess, like the Elon Musk or things like that. But you can always start with, so there's, there's always some first step or some first people you need to talk to, to that they could know that next step. That's uh, um, what comes to mind there. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. I haven't done that. Um, certainly haven't done that successfully. So take all of this with a grain of salt. I can share with you one story I heard in a podcast that was talking about, um, uh, it, was, it was a podcast about Sequoia Capital, who are a very successful um, VC firm, um, probably the most successful ever. And they were talking about the, um, the rise of um, Mac versus PC, you know, in, this, in the 80s. Um, and how there was so much kind of um, attention put onto these two companies and which one was going to succeed. 
Um, but Sequoia, their strategy was, okay, well, you know, we'll let them kill each other to death, but we're going to go for the tangential opportunity. So they bought CD drive manufacturers, they bought keyboard <laughs> manufacturers, they bought things that were adjacencies, like adjacencies to the big growth area that are a bit more accessible. You know, no one was really thinking that hard about disk drive manufacturers, but guess what? They all, they all became massive companies because you kind of rode on the coattails on it. So as an individual, most individuals in this room, I suspect, don't have a way to um, get directly involved in the rise of automated cars but you might be able to in some other way whether it's yeah i don't know I'll, <laughs> i can't speculate but there might be an opportunity there somewhere. thank you hi um did any of you guys have any advice on marketing yourself particularly online or even if you had Maybe you found that you can market yourself better not online, but at events like these or, or other venues. Do you have any advice on marketing your brand? Um, I think that you have to find the, the channels that where, you, where you play your strengths and just be authentic and be unique because nobody can be a better version of yourself than yourself. And nobody compete, can compete with that if you're doing things that flow naturally to you. So if you're really good, you know, as Josh mentioned, writing or creating videos, going to events and reaching for people on LinkedIn, or just creating kind of like more anonymous type of like marketing funnels with like, like the stuff kind of we do. Um, find what works the best for you and just double down and triple down on that. I think it's really important to um, just choose something or one or two things that you really want to get known for and then um, be consistently sharing content about those things, um, sharing little insights where you can, um, showing up at those sort of events. I think when people try and be everything to everyone, that's when nobody knows what you really represent um, and that's when you struggle to build a brand. Echo that 100%. In fact, that was pretty much the only thing I was going to say. It, and the way I think about this is um, the internet and the entire world is just full of noise, right? It's just noise absolutely everywhere. And there's this idea of the paradox of specificity. So if you get really, really specific, really, really niche, start um, producing content or writing blog posts or something about this area, that becomes your space. Um, I think, you know, in the early days when I was, um, trying software as a side hustle during, through medical school and hadn't really um, tied it together with medicine very tightly yet. A lot of the things that I would share and I would say would be full on deaf ears. But once I started sharing things specifically around automating medical processes inside hospitals from a software perspective, that's when things that started, people started listening to the things that I was writing. So right, I, I really think everyone should be writing about something niche, something as small as possible, the smaller the better, because then when, um, uh, it kind of has this magnetic effect where people who are interested in both of those niches come towards you. For the first time, I had people replying to my blog posts, sharing them, messaging me, wanting to talk because I had distilled it down so much. Of course, I have a whole lot of other interests that I reserve for my personal, you know, friends and my other timelines. But in terms of the, my blog and other online presence, I keep it very, very specific. Good one. And I mean, um, yeah, just summarize, you, you don't really need to be known by everyone but you really want to be the subject matter expert in your domain sure, yeah. yeah so writing blogs and even just stick around everyone here if you uh when the event finish stick around and connect with each other and for those who are online as well um i know it's kind of hard to interact on zoom but uh feel free to just introduce yourself on zoom at the chat and you can like just copy and paste your your linking url to get people to know you and get connected um another embarrassing part so we have um our eight our um mentoring uh, platform with UQ Young alumni, UQ alumni. So please check it out on our UQ alumni website as well. Um, and other questions on Zoom? Um, on getting to know resources to start your side hustle. So um, one of the challenges, so I just repeat the questions. One of the challenges for me is to knowing resources to assess about how to further an idea. So that's the first part of the questions. And I can answer that. We have UQ Ventures here. So for those who are here, talk to Megan afterward. For those who are not, um, uh, who is online today, uh, my colleague Kat's gonna paste the UQ Ventures link there uh, as well. So check it out. Um, we have really great stories about people, you know, starting the business with UQ. Um, for example, a friend of mine um, 
uh, one of the UQ iLab alumni, so UQ Startup Accelerator Program. Um, she um, just uh, got 500,000 investment seed investment uh, two days ago uh, for Monty. her sustainability, yes, yes. Monty, yeah. yeah, for her sustainability business. And also another uh, UQ uh, alumni, um, also a medical doctor, actually. He started um, a company called Adera. So he builds medical device for hearing uh, and he is now uh, went on IPO. So they are like, you know, stock as well. So amazing journey. Um, yes, check out UQ Ventures if you haven't. Talk to Megan later on if you are here today. Um, the second part of the question is, um, so people are hesitate to share their ideas with other people because of the IP. So they are scared of people stealing their ideas. Any comment on that? Um, I think what you'll find is that people who have been successful um, typically sort of don't have much respect for NDAs or things that you want um, to have signed to protect your idea because your idea is only the beginning. It's really about the execution. Um, yeah, that would be the only point that I would really have to share. I, I, I think that it's, yeah, like, I agree that the idea is just like it's often when people are first starting to uh, thinking of starting something new that they're going to be very protective about their idea. You could go in the middle of, you know, Queen Street or whatever and yell your idea and nothing's going to happen. <laughs> there are a lot of voices out there and no one's being heard. Uh, but I do have to say that once you started, uh, you do have to keep an eye on maybe the people that are in your same industry that have the knowledge that sometimes there could be a bit of, <laughs> but that's only once you when you when you have something running. And with people that have maybe like a directly competing competing business, but I'm gonna say that even in those cases, sometimes collaboration is just a lot better than than being too careful with your ideas. Like I I, I usually talk to some other people that have kind of competing businesses, and we just sort of share everything because I've learned and they learn. So um, yeah, in general, I'd rather I'd be open, but I haven't I haven't encountered situations where it's you you, you do have to know, but you keep an eye on things. Definitely not when you're first starting. Yeah, I think. Um in general the risk of things being stolen is just far far it's over exaggerated and the risk of you using that as a thing to sort of hide behind to delay putting yourself out to the world i've done it that's why i say it is the risk of that happening is way 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 higher it's going to get to a point where you have to become the biggest advocate for your brand slash product slash company because no one else is going to so um why not now <clears throat> of course there's a very um, slim exception to that, you know, things that are like high tech, you know, if you do actually do have a new recipe for some amazing rocket or whatever, you know, not most companies, most companies don't fall into that category. Yeah, exactly. So another question, just going through quickly, um, what are your marketing methods at a small business with a smaller budget uh, for marketing on for, for your scale to growth? Um. If we are assuming that this is some sort of a digital product or service, um, I, I, at the very least, you need you need a landing page. You need to be capturing emails as much as you can. If you put blog posts out there, always add some sort of downloadable piece, some PDF that people put their email and receive, because that's just it's just really going to compound in the long run. You're going to have all these emails, and then depending on the the type of product, you can do things like Facebook ads, and you can remarket show ads to the people that the, the emails that you have also to people that visit your page um, this thing can be as simple as as complex as you want it to be you can have um, I, 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 I would recommend definitely if you have a product out there a service to, to, to look into what channel would be best for you if it's something like very local based then maybe like like Google like local Google ads will be helpful um, the, I found that if, if there's one type of like online advertisement thing that I would recommend, that it's like a must have. It's just like, it, it's a remarketing. It's, it's basically people that visit your site, show interest, just show them an ad for seven days. That has like the highest, highest, highest uh, ROI. Um, I think this comes back to domain expertise. So if you've got a business um, for a service, uh, what problem are you solving? And sharing resources that are going to be relevant to that audience that you're trying to capture. Um, for, for my business anyway, that's been the most um, successful and low cost way of developing 
um, inbound leads. So we have a downloadable salary guide. 99.9% .9 of our clients would come through that because they go, okay, they've put the effort into developing that resource. Um, I think for a product, it's going to be completely different. But again, a product is still solving a problem or, you know, creating some sort of desire for something. Um, so again, you know, if possible, creating that expertise and creating that content, um, which is going to drive um, customers to you. Agreed, like, you know, there's obviously Google Ads, remarketing, um, that's really important. And you need to be capturing as many of those leads as possible in a database so you can go back to them or, you know, um, send them emails in the future. Yeah, um, that's, that's pretty much hit the nail on the head. A few things that I'd add. Um, People talk publicly a lot about product market fit, which is, of course, very important. Um, someone whose name is escaping me a few years ago distilled out even further into product market channel model fit. And I, I want to draw your attention to channel. You know, if you're trying to build a business out of this, by definition, you need a repeatable way to find customers and to do business. So as much as you are trying to prototype your product and find that there's a market that fits for it, you need to demonstrate that you have a repeatable way to find customers. So is that through um, producing content around a niche? Is it through um, pay-per-click ads? Is it through retargeting? Is it through, um, you know, whatever? If you don't have a repeatable way to find customers, it's going to be very hard to build a business. Outside of that, at a high level, um, the headlines are, go to where your target customers are geographically if you can. So if your customers are in a gym, go to a gym, become an authentic member of their community, start lifting weights, whatever, do what, do the things that they do, befriend them, and then produce content and educate them in a way that provides value to them. You give to them instead of take. So what I see lots of people do is, okay, I'll go join lots of um, Facebook groups for school teachers, and then I'll just post my podcast absolutely everywhere. Um, Frame it in a way where you are providing things like how-to guides, salary guides, especially if you can find a way to um, include the concept of finance and money in there, that is often very appealing. If you provide content to people, you become an, a trusted source. Holly mentioned, oh, look, this company has gone to the effort to do this. That's where you start to organically get trust. You start to build a following and a movement. That's, that's how I try to do it. Yeah, cool. And um, for the people who are here in person today, we um, probably get more questions from online because our panelists are going to stick around later. So feel free to ask questions directly to our panelists later. Um, just trying to combine two questions into one um, on, on, on Zoom here. So questions about mentoring. So where do you find your mentors? Um, and also about resources. So where do you find resources like podcasts, books, or any inspirations you get to start with your Sahaso and now your ventures? Um, as far as mentors and business coaches is concerned, I definitely proceed with caution. Um, there's a lot of business coaches out there and you definitely need to check whether or not they have, like if somebody's teaching you how to run a business, make sure they have actually run a successful business because there are a lot of dating coaches who are single and fitness, you know, personal trainers who maybe could lose some weight. Um, so find those people that you want to aspire to be like. Um, as far as actually finding them, I mean, I think you can do sort of LinkedIn searches, Google searches. I'd probably, um, I've, uh, in my role, I'm really lucky that I genuinely meet and connect with a lot of people. And then I guess it's sort of a spidey sense thing. Do I, you know, trust this person, do my research and then, you know, go from there about building a relationship with them and, and trusting their advice over time. Um, if you're not, you know, in that position to do that, you don't have anybody to go to, I would definitely start with, you know, just looking at the content and the expertise and the resources that that person's kind of producing um, and, you know, what other people they are working with that might be able to, you know, share share their insights with you. Um, as far as podcasts, um, Seize the Yay um, is a really, that's probably more female oriented. Um, but it is, um, basically, you know, different founder stories of how they got to where they are. Um, Guy Raz, how I built this, um, is another podcast, which is really interesting. Um, yeah, I love podcasts cause you can listen to them anytime, anywhere. And I believe, uh, women in digital organize catch up and events as well. Right. So yeah, check it out. Um, I, I pretty much didn't, didn't really have or I don't really have mentors so like us like on a formal basis, but I, I kind of did like the first few years just kind of on my own, just like hitting myself against the, like hitting the walls and somehow going around them. Or um, it's only been just more recently, I guess, that I've been reaching out to people that have like 
I think what, what Holly said that that have demonstrated that they can do what they are they could teach you what you could learn from them uh, so that in my case has, has not included the like not people that are kind of like business coaches as a title it's just more like people that have run a certain type of business of a certain scale and I would have questions for them I would like to know how they did this or how they did that um, so uh, I would recommend finding yeah like people that are knowledgeable in the in the particular industry or vertical or domain that you are interested in in starting a business in um, it, it's, it's hard to recommend exactly which ones because it will depend exactly you know for each person and, and that, I guess that brings me to my other point which is that none of the advice that you normally get is like tailored to you like in, you know and so you have to have you know very critical thinking in, in everything that you hear because some people will say you should build it yourself if you can. Some other people should, are going to say, you should not build. You should think as a system from the beginning and find the people who are the best at it and they'll build it for you. Like you, you're going to find every sort of possible type of advice, um, and it's not tailored to you. So that's something that I would just keep, keep into consideration. Um, I I learn from from books, from from Twitter, um, bit all over the place. Um, it's again hard to, to recommend depending on the on the domain, but. Uh, uh, I, I would suggest that, that that you immerse yourself in the area that you are interested in, and that, that it needs to flow naturally as well. You need to read some of this stuff. It needs to be fun to, to read. Um, it, if it all feels like work, maybe find that some other area that's more that where you can have will have that that passion. Yeah, absolutely. Echo a lot of that. Um, just on that point about advice, some I think I read it on LinkedIn, but it was something like most business advice is rubbish, including this or something like that. And so I don't know how. <laughs> Let's say that one ten times fast. Um, but for me, um, there have been a lot of really very successful entrepreneurs in my network who I've just um, sort of accrued by going to events kind of like this. Um, another plug for UQ Ventures. Um, I've been welcomed with open arms there for the last probably three years. Um, everyone is willing to set up everyone with anyone. So, you know, if you go to any event and you run into someone like Nimrod Clayman, who's like one of the most connected people on the, the earth, um, and you say, oh, I want to do this, and you'll be like, I know a guy or a gal, and he'll set you up. And, um, you know, if you um, congregate in a community of people dealing with similar problems with you, you'll either meet someone who can help you solve them or someone who can help you meet someone um, who can help you get there. <clears throat> Awesome. So uh, just conscious of the time, we are wrapping up the session today um, and we will jump to the uh, final notes uh, later on. But if um, all of you can just scan the QR code here or you can search the URL as well, um, both online and in person, uh, we really want to hear from you. We really want to hear the feedback uh, of this event and that's determine how our event going to run for the next time. Um, yeah, just give a few minutes for you guys to uh, fill out a survey. Only nine, ten questions, uh, really quick. Um, just a quick comment would be really awesome. So while yeah, so while um, our participants are filling out the survey and listening, um, let's wrap up. So if I asked you to wrap up your, you know, um, conversation and in one advice with a hashtag, how it's going to be and why? With a hashtag. Um, mum would be hashtag just do it. That's a bit cliche, but, you know, we've had, we've spoken a lot about strategy and tactics and all this sort of stuff. Um, all of that has these big asterisks over it that you have to, kind of like what I said right at the beginning, put something up for sale, just do it and the rest hopefully will fall into place for you, but it can't until you do that. Until you stick your neck out, it can't happen. So allow it to happen by putting something up there. Um, I'm gonna say that it, it shouldn't feel like work, although sometimes you will hate it, but it should primarily feel like something you're doing for fun. I don't know what hashtag to go with. <laughs> Just do it, whatever. Oh, um, I'm gonna say hashtag don't do it all. Um, so. <laughs> Pick one thing that you're one, you know, one or two problems that you're going to solve and really become the expert in those. Awesome. And I probably can wrap up here. Um, for all the questions on Zoom, uh, we can't go through that uh, today, but uh, we will document those and we'll send it to the panelists and we can spend some time to answer questions. And for those who are in person today, feel free to stick around and mingle and talk to our panelists. Um, and just a few things coming up for our next events. 
So we have a finance webinar, as mentioned, about investing in super. So come along on 15 July. It's going to be online on Zoom as well. Uh, and also we have another Global Connections Young Alumni Drinks on 5th of August. So come along. Um, and hopefully you fill out the survey. Um, so for the survey, um, we, we are doing a lucky draw. So um, once you fill out the survey, it's optional though. So uh, one out of five of, um, will be chosen to, to, uh, to get our free tickets for our next event. So that's all from us today. Thank you everyone for joining. Please stick around later on and enjoy some drinks together. Thanks.